So in today's video about power stuff, we're going to talk about uh, solar and battery. And in particular about some things I did when I was designing the power system for this house. And so this is just a picture of the solar system just shortly after it was installed. Um, and so there are 53 panels um, set uh, across uh, one of the garage elements here and then on the upper roof. Uh, and in this case, uh, south is basically uh, this way. And so these have reasonably good uh, coverage. In Oregon in particular, most of the power generation happens during the summer. They probably generate easily more than half of the total year's power in the center three or three and a half months um, of summer. And so this orientation actually works out pretty well. Um, there obviously is some tree shading when the sun is coming up. And of course, when the sun is about to set, it's entirely shaded. Um, these panels are the uh, LG panels and they have the in-phase microinverters. So the panels, of course, produce DC and then go into the microinverters, which produces AC. And so what comes off the roof is AC power going right into the main house power systems. Uh, so let's start by heading upstairs and we'll take a look at the meters and then we'll look at the inside panels and then we'll just have a quick conversation about a few of the nerdy details. So off we go. So here we are at the meters and so we'll talk a little bit about what the design elements were of picking this and how it was designed. So as far as the meters themselves, they're fed from a transformer, which is back over behind that wall over there. Um, and it is a 50 kVA transformer. And the high voltage for that comes from the street, which is about a half a mile away. And that the high voltage lines are buried underground and make their way over to the transformer. And then of course the transformer connects under some conduit right here over to um, these meter bases. I did run three relatively large conduits um, just in case I wanted to add another 200 or 400 amps uh, service. Um, that go to the transformer. And so if you're going to put the conduits, put more in because the conduit's cheap to do now or cheap to do when you're building and expensive to do now. Um, so the circuit layout or the, or the panel layout is there's a 400 amp circuit here. This is the primary sort of main house power, you might call it. Um, and this panel is kind of a cool panel. And I picked it out on purpose because it's a little unique in that it has two 200 amp breakers. And these are both fed off the bus bar that connects to the meter. Um, and then it has this space here for eight more breakers, but these breakers are actually on the main bus bar connected to the meter. They aren't behind these breakers. And there are a number of panels that have extra breakers in them, but a lot of them, the breakers are a sub part of one of these two breakers. This is not true, they're all in parallel. And so that means I can have a 200 amp output here going to a switch on the other side of this wall for sort of the main house stuff. An additional 200 going to the shop downstairs. And then two more, 125s, going to two other panels in the house that I call non-gen. And so these are things that are not as essential and that I don't necessarily have to have on a generator or usable when we are um, off-grid. And so it's a neat panel, a neat way to do that kind of uh, distribution. Um, and so we also have two meters. And in some jurisdictions, two meters can be challenging in one house in portland you only can do it if they have separate different rate plans and so this one is a normal oregon rate plan which is a fixed rate so it's a fixed cost no matter when you use the power um, and then the second panel which is a second 200 amp service is only for ev charging and so this is on a time of use plan which means that of course that it charges more or costs more during the day and less at night and for an ev that works fine because you can set the evs to charge um, at night and the price differential is I want to say it's like a third the price between the highest and the lowest so it's a pretty good deal to do um, if you know you're going to have some EVs and so on this panel I have 200 amp circuits um, one going to a pair of Tesla chargers in the upper garage and one going to a pair of chargers in the uh, lower garage and so uh, it gives it plenty of capacity for charging cars um, and maybe you know future car charging things, um, but on its own separate service from uh, the main 400 amp service. There's a disconnect here for the solar and then a separate disconnect for the battery system. I added the batteries after the solar and they each needed an externally uh, exposed um, disconnect. 
So let's go inside the garage here and we'll look at the, where the power goes um, from this point. Okay, here we are inside. And uh, these three panels were sort of the original panel layout when I first built the house. So the 200 amps from the main feed, the 400, it breaks into a 200. That one, one of them comes here, which is to a Generac uh, transfer switch. This goes to a transfer switch plug that's on the outside, uh, intended for a roll-up generator. Um, and the power comes out of this, and then normally went into this panel here, which is sort of the on-gen panel. So these are things that I wanted to be on generator or on you know, backup power. And this uh, panel then feeds two more panels. So there's 225 amp feeds from here to other panels. And then a few circuits on this panel as well. And this is things like all the lights, all the plugs, the furnaces, stuff that's sort of critical that you want to have running um, even when you're on um, generator power. And then there's another panel to the right here that is one of the two what I call non-gen panels. And so these are loads that are not as essential. Things like there's an RV plug, um, the uh, hot tub and the driveway circuits and a few other things um, are in here that are not as critical to have on a generator in case of a power loss. And so the, that's sort of a simple layout of how I did things. And then after that was done, I added the solar system and the solar system comes in through this panel here. And so there are a total of six arrays, each one's 20 amps. Uh, that feeds into this panel, so it's a total of uh, a little bit over 20 kilowatts. It's 53 LG panels, and so those all feed into here, uh, and then feed into that main panel over there and provide um, solar power input. There's a little box there tracking, so we're producing 11.7 uh, kilowatts right now. Um, it's not, it's sunny, but uh, getting low in the evening, so it's a little low. It'll peak out at about maybe 16, 16 and a half kilowatts um, when the sun is right above. And so that solar power is now going into the main uh, box here and probably based on our current usage, probably pushing some back to the grid. Um, I then added uh, the battery system. The battery system is composed of really two pieces. The first are the batteries themselves, which are over here. And uh, these are the um, in-phase IQ batteries, the 10.2 kilowatt hour batteries, there's four of them, so a total of about 41 kilowatt hours. Um, and these batteries have in them basically three little DC power plants. And then on top, there are an array of microinverters. And those microinverters are very similar to the ones used in regular solar, except these can go in reverse and can also generate a grid. Normally microinverters can only see a grid and add power to it. These can generate a grid so they can produce a grid when one doesn't exist. And so what's coming out of here is AC power um, normal 240 volt AC power, which then makes its way through a little combiner box. Um, and then back over here to the other key component, which is the smart switch. And so the in-phase smart switch, the idea is that the 200 amp service that was coming in here and going to here, I diverted. So it now goes over to here through the smart switch. Out of the smart switch comes another 200 amp service, which then goes back over to this panel. So now the smart switch is sort of in the middle of that loop, and the idea is that if the power goes out and the smart switch senses that the power went out, it will click a contactor and disconnect the house from the grid and then tell the batteries, make a grid. And so the batteries will create a grid and then start outputting power, um, and everything in the house will just see power. And it does all that in about 100 milliseconds, so it's relatively hard to detect. It's gone off before and I haven't noticed it. Um, you know, things in the house just, you don't, you don't really notice it at all. Uh, and the idea is that then you're isolated from the grid, so the, so the switch has disconnected you from any in, of in the incoming feeds, and you're now running off the power being generated by the batteries. And there are a couple of cool things about this. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that the batteries um, generate a 240 volt AC grid, which comes into here, and makes its way over into the smart switch. And then there is a relatively large transformer right here. Um, and that transformer is used to generate the neutral uh, to make it possible to have 120 volts. Because in a normal house installation, the transformer, in my case, the one way over there, the power company's transformer is what uh, gives you that central neutral leg to give you the 120. But since we disconnected the grid, there is no transformer out there connected. And so this has its own transformer to create the um, center tap uh, feed for the neutral to give you 120 volts and, uh, as well as 240. Uh, second cool thing about the system is that um, 
when you're on battery power, so it's making a grid and powering this panel, uh, the solar system still works. So the solar system can produce power and push it into this system while we're disconnected from the grid. And that can do two things. One is, of course, is it can power things in your house. You're making power for the things that are drawing power. And it can also be used to charge the batteries. So the batteries, in some ways, act a little bit like a capacitor in that they can provide power if needed. And if solar is pushing extra power, it can go back into the batteries to keep them charged. Now, there's some really neat nuances there because you can imagine it's possible for the solar system to produce more power than what the house is using, and the batteries could be full. And in that case, they have a neat mechanism for feeding back to the solar microinverters to hint at them to back off their power production. It's kind of a, a cool setup. Um, but it's a great thing because when you're off grid, um, your solar system still works. And that's somewhat unusual. In most solar configurations, it requires the presence of a grid to produce power. They won't make one by themselves. Um, but because we have the batteries that can make a grid, uh, and then the switch, and then the combination with solar, you can run off the combination of what's in your batteries as well as what the solar can put into the batteries or into the house. Uh, there's also a, a generator integration. So this will auto start a generator when the batteries get low. So when the batteries get down to 20%, it'll fire up the generator and it'll generally run the generator at almost full load to charge the batteries um, and also you know, provide some power into the house. Uh, and then turn the generator off once it gets back up to 90%. And that's really cool because if you just have a generator, it works great, except the generator has to be running all the time if you want an AC grid in your house. Even if you want your alarm clock to have AC power, the generator has to be running, including running all night. And the generators are relatively inefficient when they're running at very, very low load. And so this is cool because it'll only turn the generator on when it needs to charge the batteries and then turn it off. And so throughout the entire night, you're running off battery uh, and if in later in the morning or the day you need to charge up again, it'll fire up the generator, you know, run it at a relatively high load to charge the batteries and then turn it back off again. So it's a really cool, well-integrated system. Um, Enphase did a good job of integrating both the, the way solar and the way the um, batteries integrate into the system. Um, and most of all, it's seamless in the sense that I don't do anything. It does everything by itself. Um, you know, if you were standing here when the power went out, you might hear this click, but that's about it. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't even know that you would switch to battery. Um, 40, what, 41, 42 kilowatt hours of battery storage is pretty good, especially for most houses. Um, that could last a long time. Uh, and when you combine it with solar, of course, you have even more total capable generation. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool system. I think compared to things like the, the Tesla system, it's a little bit better integrated for things like having a generator. Um, and having sort of other power sources. And so that's sort of a quick look at the high-level power system for my house. So I thought we'd talk about a couple of kind of small nerdy details based off what we just saw up in the, uh, the meter and the panel area. Uh, one of the interesting things to think about with the whole solar battery system is that you can have solar panels that are on your roof and the solar panels have little microinverters attached to them. And these microinverters are producing AC power. And you know, that AC power is typically attached into maybe one of your panels. And so it could be attached into lugs in the panel or through a breaker um, that connects up to the rest of the house. And these microinverters are designed to detect the presence of the grid and then be the sunny produce some power and push it into the grid. And one of the interesting things is that if you then add, so in my case, I have this battery system sitting over here and uh, you know the battery has these DC batteries and these little microinverters in here, and they also output AC power, similarly attached into sort of this grid. Um, and then there's also this control box that I have and the control box allows you to take the incoming grid and map it through to the panel, uh, but also have in here a little transformer. And when the main power fails and you're running off this whole internal system, this little transformer here, of course, is generating, I should have driven all like this, is generating the neutral needed to give you 120 volts. And the batteries are providing that grid, generating the grid and providing power. And then of course the uh, panels can also be producing power. 
And what's interesting is that, of course, the in normal operation, the microinverters on the solar panels, um, if the grid is in fact here, so if the grid is hooked up, as far as the microinverters are concerned, the grid is sort of an infinite sink. In other words, they will produce as much power as they can. And as long as there is a grid present, then the grid can absorb whatever power you can produce. Uh, and the grid in some ways is like an infinite battery. And here in Oregon, we actually get paid the same for pushing to the grid as we do drawing from the grid. So you are kind of encouraged to use it um, almost like a big battery. Uh, but nonetheless, their, their regulation is just make as much power as you can, because if the house doesn't use it and the batteries don't use it, then the grid will use it. And so um, there's not a need for any other regulation other than the grid can take as much power as you can push. And sure enough, when you apply for a permit to connect to the grid, one of the things they look at is the amount of power that you could produce and how that affects the locality of your location and the transformers and the transmission lines that you're in because you're gonna be pushing power back out. Um, generally not a huge issue for these normal um, consumer systems, but if you had a really big one, it could be something you have to work with them on. Um, but so when you're off grid, so again, no grid power here, then the microinverters in the AC system or the um, microinverters in the solar system can be producing power and it can be producing 15 kilowatts. And if you aren't drawing that much in the house, then that power has got to go somewhere and that could go into the battery. But if the battery gets to 100% full, then it's got to do something because the microinverters here are still going to produce power. And it turns out that there is a neat kind of protocol where when you're off grid, the battery system is the one producing the grid. And so it creates the 60 Hertz uh, sort of waveform that everything else in the house and the uh, solar system will follow. And it turns out that it can vary the frequency from 60 to 61.5 Hertz. And that variance is used as an indicator of basically a back pressure against the solar microinverters to produce less power. So if they get 61.5, it's at 100% where it tells the inverters to produce no power. Um, and it's kind of a cool thing because you wouldn't otherwise notice that. A small variance in the frequency is not something you could detect. Uh, but it uses it as a way to signal to the microinverters, hey, you're making lots of juice and we got nowhere for it to go, so back off. Um, and it's, it's a, I thought it was kind of a novel thing. And it's also worth considering that if you were off-grid and you didn't have batteries, but you did have a big old generator sitting here, and your generator is running, producing all the power that your house needs and also producing a grid, this can cause some problems because if the microinverters are producing a ton of power and your house isn't using it, it will try to push that power back into the generator and that will cause lots of bad things to happen, maybe a, maybe a fire or two. Um, so you generally want to avoid that. And actually one of the things they do in the microinverters is that generators generally produce not super perfect 60 hertz output. Um, oftentimes it'll be a little bit above that because if it's a, you know, it's a mechanically regulated generator, they generally run the motor just slightly above what it needs to be so that it can handle some variances in load. Uh, and sure enough, the microverters are designed to detect that if the grid is either running a little fast or if it has um, a lot of variance to it, then they'll shut down and not produce power at all. Uh, and that's designed so you won't accidentally try to push power into a generator. They recommend, by the way, that if you hook up a generator that you disconnect the solar system so there's no chance of it accidentally pushing into your generator and, and causing bad things to happen. But I thought that the control mechanism of varying the frequency because you're in control of that was a really neat way um, to have a seamless system that doesn't require any out-of-band communication from the batteries over to the solar array. So I thought that was kind of a cool, neat engineering thing. Uh, if you have any questions about this whole power setup or anything else you want to explore, then leave me a comment. Thanks.